the relationship of mastering something and time. How, how do you navigate that? Are there shortcuts? Are there ways to, to get there a little quicker? Things like reading, maybe? Um, well, I'm of the belief um, that if you want a shortcut, you're already not very well suited for becoming a master. Your need for a shortcut is a bad idea. It's already a sign of trouble. Um, to master anything, you need patience. You need to know about the 10,000 hour rule, which is a bit of a cliche now. Everyone sort of spout, talks about it. Nobody really understands or has gone into, de very few people have gone into depth about what that means. It's a great study that pretty much demonstrated that after 10,000 hours of repetition in a, practicing a particular skill set, something literally happens to the human brain. A, a transformation occurs. And the study was based on simple things that you could study, like chess, where you're basically playing the same game, and you've put in 10,000 hours, and you have a mastery of the board and the process. You're not having to, to think anymore. And so after studying great chess players and musicians, it was determined that reaching that 10,000 hour mark was something magical. Now it could be 9,500 9, hours, it could be 10,000. It depends, there's a little leeway, but it's, it's great science. So to answer your question, you have to be willing to go through that process and go through those hours. Every field is different. Some fields require several skills. You're not just learning chess, you're learning business and you're learning the tech certain technical aspects and et cetera, you're combining skills. So that might require a little bit more than 10,000 hours. But the idea that I can somehow short circuit the process is a bad psychology. You're already setting yourself up for failure and impatience. I say that there is one shortcut that I will be willing to acknowledge and that is having a great mentor. Mm -hmm. So if you have somebody who is an expert in the field or you respect and has already put in the 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000 hours, that person can steer you. They can say, look, Brendan, you, you're pretty good at this skill, but you have this weakness. Start working more on that. And normally, if you didn't have a mentor, you might, our tendency in practice, in practicing a skill, is to pra over practice what we're already good at. Yeah. So let's just take basketball for instance. You have a great outside shot, three point shot, but you really suck when it comes to uh, taking your, your, uh, the defender off the dribble and you know, being able to create some space for a shot or a layup. Your tendency will be to practice that outside three-point shot because you're already good at it and it feels good and it's fun. And you don't want to have to practice taking someone off the dribble because it's hard. You have to work with a defender. It's a, you have to overcome that and practice exactly what you're not good at and it's not easy. A mentor will tell you, will look at you and say, you're weak here, practice that. They'll also say, avoid this, don't waste time here. They could cut that 10,000 hours down to 9,000 maybe if they're really good, they're really smart. Or instead of wasting your time and you having to go to 12,000 hours, they'll, they'll bring it down closer to that target level. That's the only shortcut I will acknowledge. But in general, relying on that crutch, thinking in your mind, God damn, if I, I can find an Algorand app to <laughs> shortcut it, you're already a loser Yeah. in my book. Yeah. So get over that. Embrace the pain, is what I say. Pain is good for you. It's great for you. When you work out, we all like to work out. I'm a, a, a fanatic of working out, and particularly swimming is my thing. Um, it's painful. Yeah. You know, I swim long distances. I used to swim several miles, now I can only do like a mile and a half at the most. But you know, you reach the half a mile or three quarters of a mile, man, it, you're, it's like, this is no fun. But when you finish and you've gone through weeks and months, you feel some, you, the, the value that you get is much greater than the pain. That pain, that resistance is good for you. And the idea that you want to sweet, sweeten the pot and, or shortcut or get something 
you know, like a sugar high, uh, you're already in, you're already on dangerous ground. Yeah. So were you naturally inclined to, to do things like these long swims and, and take on pain and, and go through a, a rigorous writing process or did you have a way to build into taking pain? Um, I probably have a high tolerance for pain. Um, I kind of probably built it up. I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. Some of it, I think, is slightly genetic. I, uh, it's hard to say. I know my father, for instance, was very meticulous. He was not an intellectual or uh, by any means. He, he was somebody really good with his hands. I told you he was a mechanic in the Navy. Yeah. He loved building models, and he would build elaborate models of ships. Um, you know, 18th century, 17th century galleys, galleons, etc. And I would watch him, and he was just incredibly patient for that kind of detail. I have no patience for working with my hands. I'm not very good at that. So, but maybe I kind of inherited that a little bit. Um, and some of it, you know, when you're younger, when you're in your 20s, I probably didn't have nearly as much patience as I did. You've got that youthful energy, you're bursting, you want to try many different things. Yeah. You know, uh, it, so I'm sure when I was in my 20s, I was a bit scattered in trying different things. Um, but I found uh, working on books, um, the kind of books I write, was actually the perfect thing for me. Um, if I never found the kind of book like The 48 Laws of Power, I might not have amounted to much because I am a little bit um, scattered by nature. And having to write a book made me focus, made me, it, it, it worked into all of my strengths because mm. I love reading. So I think writing the books has kind of altered my brain and made me a lot better able to withstand that. But when it came to exercise, I've always sort of liked long distances, cross country running. I, I can't do that anymore, but I used to run. I, I don't know why, but I liked the distance type things where you had to overcome your, your own mind. You had to kind of discipline your own, that, those levels of pain. So I always sort of enjoyed that kind of thing. Maybe I have a masochist at heart. I don't know. <laughs> well, maybe I am too. I was a, I was a cross country runner in college oh, and things and yeah. could completely relate. Well, also those kind of things like cross country running uh, or, or the sw swimming distances, it's very meditative. Mm -hmm. You kind of zone out after several miles running. It's kind of nice. You get a little bit of a high from it. And you yeah. can, that high gets addicting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so to this idea of, of shortcuts and maybe a mentor being the shortcut, if yeah. there is one. You've talked in mastery about how you can you can learn from a book, how you can kind of see a book as as a mentor. You can you can have a conversation with the author. You can yes. read in a more active way. How how should someone go about that process? Well, God, that's a good question. I talk a little bit about it in in my new book. Um, a lot of the time when you're reading a book, it depends on on what the book is about. Really, I mean, um, you're kind of the, the, the material that you're reading is you tend to make it dead and I am thinking what you want to do is to make it come to life mm -hmm. so reading a book is like bringing something dead to life it's like taking Frankenstein and imbuing it with life now what do I mean by that well you're kind of reading it um, mechanically just the words you're not paying great attention you don't realize that the writer, if it's a good writer, when they had those, those thoughts that they're writing about, it was something um, very exciting to them at the moment, very alive. Um, and they tried to put it on paper. And, and whenever you write an idea down, something is lost in the translation. Like when it was in your mind, it was very exciting. And when it came on the paper, so that's not quite it. Your process is to kind of get inside the writer and feel that excitement, feel, it's, it's what I call empathy, it's partly empathy, it's in mastery I call it thinking from the inside out. You go inside the book, inside the spirit, you try and recapture what they were feeling, not just what they were writing. I know that's abstract and we could talk for three hours about the process, um, but for instance, on another level, let's say a biography, mm -hmm. Napoleon Bonaparte, 
was the hero of, of the 33 Strategies of War, one of my favorite people to study. Um, I call him the Mozart of warfare. He, he w went well beyond the 10,000 hours when it came to strategy. He was absolutely a genius. Um, I read maybe 4,000 pages worth of material on Napoleon to prepare for this book. Gosh. Particularly one great book called The Campaigns of Napoleon by, I believe it's David Chandler. It's about 13, 1,400 pages. And it, it's de incredible detail about every battle with great maps. I highly, the uh, book's way out of print, mm -hmm. quite expensive, but it's, it's, if you love Napoleon and you're into battles and maps, this is the book for you. Anyway, my goal was, I want to bring Napoleon to life. I want to, I want to feel like he's in the room with me here. I want to know what, how he thought, you know, what made him a genius. So I go into it and I'm trying to dig it up and come to terms with what's alive about Napoleon. And I found that the books I read were missing his genius. They were, they were not quite getting at it. I'm not saying I'm the only one that did, but I felt like at a certain point I understood him. I understood how his brain worked. And I came to the conclusion that what made Napoleon so great was he had a mind for organizing information that was vastly superior to anybody else before the invention of computers. And it was his ability to assimilate vast amounts of information and create strategies in the moment that made him feel so superior. That's the kind of reading that I'm talking about where you're not just on the surface, not just reading the words, but you're thinking, you're analyzing it, you're bringing it to term in relation to your own life, your own experiences, and you're making Frankenstein come to life. Yeah. Is there any... I mean, it's, I, it's very abstract. I can go into more, but that's, that's sort of my method. Yeah. I would wonder if you have any, any specific tactics on that. I know, like when I read Mastery, I, I held a pen and I was all over it, circling, dog-earing, you know, jotting notes in the margins, and that helped me to engage with the ideas in a, in a deeper way than I would have if I'd been sort of more passive. Do you have anything specific yeah, you like? I mean, you just hit on it. You're, it's versus the passive form of reading. Mm -hmm. So you're active. So you're arguing with the, with the writer. That's, I mean, this is one idea. Yeah. Um, so I always write in the margin. Mm -hmm. Some people hate that. They feel like writing in a book is sacrilegious, <laughs> like you're, you know, you're spoiling it or, you know. Yeah. But I'm not like that. I, I write a lot. And if I don't like a writer, and that happens often, and I get angry, I start putting giant <laughs> X's and I say, fuck you. <laughs> and I say that, I say, fuck you. Yeah. I get really angry. Yeah. But otherwise, usually I like it. And I'm putting exclamation mark, great, yes. And I'm, I engage. So you're engaging with the material. You're not a, pa as you said, you're not a passive reader. Mm -hmm. You're arguing with it. You're thinking, so the, the problem here is it slows you down. You don't, mm. you're not, unless it's a bad book, bad books or mediocre books, I kind of can skim. But if it's a really good book, it engages you, you're arguing with it, you're writing, and it, it slows you down, that's for sure. But I, I maintain it's better to read one juicy book that grabs you, that really engages you, that really makes you think, than to read 10, you know, kind of, trivial books that don't have it. So writing in the margins, arguing with the book, um, trying to think more deeply about what the writer is saying, um, analyzing uh, instead of just reading it, and bringing it to your own life. Mm -hmm. So if I'm talking about, um, like in Mastery, just to bring in the war aspect, Cesar Rodriguez, the the um, fighter pilot, yes. who's the last decorated, um, what do you call it? Uh, An ace. Ace in the uh, in, in Air Force. Was he in the Air Force or the Marines? Air Force. Air Force, thank you, God. Um, <laughs> you know, you're, I, I'm talking about he was someone who was not your typical ace. He wasn't a golden boy. Mm -hmm. He's like five foot five. Um, he didn't, didn't look like a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. And um, he 
felt like he was had three strikes against him the moment he started. He, he was a slow learner. Um, he wasn't a natural at it. Um, and so he had to learn, I call it trusting the process, that if he practiced harder than the Golden Boys, if he spent more hours on the simulator than they did, if he didn't take for granted his skill, he would catch up with them. Now you're reading that and you're going, eh, blah, 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 and you're, you know, you're not really paying <laughs> attention. But if you're smart, you're going, all right, when did that happen to me? Mm. You know, when have I, like, in, in a sport, I felt like this wasn't good for me? Maybe I gave up too early. I talk about the frustration and how frustration is a good thing for you. If you're frustrated, it shows your body is telling, your body and your mind is telling you that you can actually overcome something. And the moment you're feeling frustration is it actually a turning point, a good moment. Um, Relate that to yourself. Don't just don't read about Cesar Rodriguez and think blah, 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 blah. Relate that to your own experience when you felt frustration and you either gave up or you pushed through it. That's active reading. That's making something come to life. Yeah. So frustration as a good thing, as something that we want. You're, are you saying it's, it's, a, it's a trigger? It's something to look for? Definitely. Um, if you don't feel frustrated when you're learning something, you're not learning, okay. and you're, in, you're, you're deluding yourself, mm -hmm. and you're probably going, so they call that practice that I mentioned before, where you practice what you're weak at, deliberative practice in, in the business, when people talk about skills. You're deliberately working on what you're not good at. Mm -hmm. Your tendency is to try and make things easy for you because you don't like pain, we humans don't like pain. So if you're going through your practice and things, wow, things are really easy, I'm enjoying it, it's fun, you're probably not learning, you're probably doing this lopsided practice that we're talking about, and you're avoiding your weaknesses, um, and things are going too smoothly. It's the frustration isn't just the fact also um, that you're not mastering it, it's also that it, it, it's kind of, um, it seems like a mystery. You don't quite know what you need to do. Something is eluding you. Um, and I maintain, and it's a little bit, you have to believe me, because there's not rigorous science behind this. I usually like to have things backed by rigorous science. It's based more on things that athletes talk about. But that moment of frustration, or actually mathematicians have talked about it, that moment of deepest frustration is actually a signal from your body, physically a signal, that you're actually on the way to, to a breakthrough. Um, that you feel, you're, 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 it's telling you, it's a signal um, that something is churning up inside, inside you and you're not yet aware of it. Um, so a lot of that is based on anecdotal evidence, like a great music, mathematician like this man Jacques Hadamard that I talk about, he would say his greatest breakthroughs, or Einstein, came just at that moment where I, you were about to give up. And um, there's a great instance of uh, anecdote about the composer Brahms, and he was so frustrated with this one symphony that he was trying to write that he said, I'm giving up, I, I can't write it, I, that's it. And the moment he gave up, the next day, all this, the solution, per, the perfect solution came to him. Um, so there's a lot of, and athletes talk about that. So I'm basing it on anecdotal elements and my own experience. When I'm writing a chapter, I get so frustrated and so annoyed. My girlfriend, I'm like driving her up a wall, you know. I, I'm just like yelling at the cat. I, I can't take it anymore. I'm the worst writer. I'm about to give up. And like, it's almost mechanical. The next day or two days later, it all comes to, you know, it all fits. So if you go through that enough, you know that that frustration is a good thing. And once you know that, it's very liberating because you're able to wait for the, for the breakthrough moment that will come. You don't give up. You give up, maybe, but you're kind of kidding yourself knowing that the moment you say, I give up, tomorrow or the next day, the great idea will come to you. So it's a little bit of faith, but frustration, if you don't have the frustration, 
you're not on the right you're not on the right path. Well, thanks for watching that video. To see the full episode, check out the box over here or the link in the description.